Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the 10th anniversary meeting of MIECTIS. Um, to open this perfusionist session, um, we have Hans Yenny, clinical perfusionist um, at the University Hospital of Bern, and he will be discussing uh, minimized circuits, optimized perfusion strategies this morning. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear chairman, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a big honor also to open the, the day. Yesterday I had also the honor to open the session. I do it for the second time now. Philip, look, please. So I will talk about the modern perfusion strategy, not just about circuits, uh, about the, the modern strategy, how we have to perfuse patients. Of course, one really important component is the system, you know, and the system has to be maximal biocompatible. Bio that is, is a fact, yeah. And then suction blood management, of course, and then I will also a bit focus on the uh, safety strat strategy. It's also important to have an effective safety strategy for the perfusion strategy. And as well, we have to start or we have to perfuse we call that in burn patient adapted perfusion. So we really have to adapt our perfusion to the patient, or we can also call that individualized perfusion strategy. And on the end, data collection and data analysis. That's a, a big part of new perfusion. Also to, to give a clip into the future and to get new parameters perhaps one day. It's quite clear we have to um, reduce the inflammatory response. That's quite new. It is quite known. But it, we have uh, different actions what we can do. Of course, we have can shortening the, the tube. We can also minimize the, the surface. But what we heard yesterday as well, we often discuss about the reduced cardiac index. So we say in mini bypass, for example, we can reduce our <coughs> cardiac index to two, for, for example, I don't know exactly how high we did in burn as we did MEC between 1.8 and 2. What that, uh, that says to us, we do not need any more so big oxygenators, for example, because if you look here for Terumo, we have the Terumo FX15. The Terumo FX15 has a maximum flow of five liters. And with five liters in the index of two, you can perfuse 90% of all European people. <laughs> Plus other countries are a bit heavier. But in, normally in, in Europe, 90% of the patient you can provide with a FX15 instead, for example, of a FX25. And what that means for us, Yesterday, uh, uh, Mark van really told that the, the biggest surface is the venous uh, reservoir, but also the oxygenator. If you compare that, then you have a difference in the membrane surface of one square meter. That makes a surface in uh, 34 meters of 3-8 tubing. You can economize just to use a different oxygenator. On the other hand, we have to minimize priming volume. That's, that's clear. We all know that. We also have to think about, about the impact on DO2 because uh, I go to the preoperative approaches. I think DO2 therapy starts based in the general doctor. You know, it starts two or three weeks before the patient comes into the OR. We'll show you an example later. So that's really important and we can discuss in a group that patients will not come with low hemoglobin into, into the race, you know. On RAP is, of course, we have to practice RAP. That is not a question. I give you an example from a patient, quite uh, a mitral valve redo, a uh, patient with 90 kilos, one, eight, one, uh, one, meter, uh, one meter and 80 centimeters. He comes in a race with nine, with a hemoglobin of nine <clears throat> gram per deciliter, PO2 200 on the machine, saturation is clear. So if we have a flow from five liter, this patient has a DO2 index of 306 and we, we feel comfortable. What if, if during the case, the patient, for example, our blood loss, and then the, the hemoglobin decreases to seven. I calculate it now. Now this patient has a, a DO2 index from 241. So he has a higher risk for acute injury. What can I do? So I have two actions to do. I can increase the flow or I can add uh, red cells. So I calculate it. If I want to achieve with a hemoglobin from seven for this patient and a, a DO2 from more than 285, I have to increase the flow to 5.9. I forgot to mention this patient is cannulated femorally, we have 25 from Biomedicos. Now the point is, if I have a cannula of 25 French in this patient, I will never be able to increase the flow to 5.9. So I'm really <laughs> a bit uh, trapped, you know, as a perfusionist. It sounds always easy. You could just increase the flow, but I have no option to increase the flow. If you look here on the flow chart from this cannula, 
that is a bit the problem. And that's why I said, if the patient, they come, DO2 starts earlier. DO2 gives us not so much opportunity during a perfusion as we expect. And on the other hand, we also, a hospital we, we teach, I tell always on my students, okay, now we have a situation, your DO2 is perhaps lower, but will, that will not mean that your patient now we will make a kidney injury. This patient has a higher risk now. You can imagine on your screen, then you have a blinking parameter. Oh, this parameter is now on a, in a red or something like that. So that means he has a higher risk, but sometimes we have to accept because the other option will be this patient get red cells. And we all know red cells, that is really a high risk for acute injury. So the only thing we can do, and that is the problem a bit nowadays, we do not have so much opportunities. For example, I go to jump a bit back. Is as an as a old perfusionist, you know, we have it in... <laughs> In the, in, the, in the back, so we will cool down, for example, the patient. That's the reaction we did in the past. But the other hand is also how we can react on a low DO2, perhaps what the, what's the role of the, pre uh, the pressure. You know, we have no idea the, between uh, DO2 and perhaps we can, if we are not able to increase the DO2, perhaps we can increase the pressure. So it has a lack of data. Okay. Sorry. And of course, we have to minimize the blood air contact. That's also new. But here I have a bit provocative question, you know, or perhaps someone can answer me this question for the audience then after. Is there a, a, a certain uh, amount of uh, blood air contact when we can accept, for example, or tolerate, you know, because that will easier our life massively, you know, because we really try to avoid 100% blood air contact. I feel fully understand. But is there a limit of blood air contact and we can accept because we can make the systems quite easier if we will do that? It's just a, a question to the audience. And if you go back and we see which systems uh, fits best with all these recommend, uh, requirements, that's of course is the MEC systems, sure. And um, there are the, our best for that. Uh, yes, type best will be type four, that's for sure. But even in type 4, you have to deal with the, with the um, vent blood. And that is the point that often clinics, they, they are a bit afraid about mini vipers of type 4. Because the suction blood management becomes key then. And uh, i just show you this slide because there's some open question. If you use a mini viper system and you separate the suction blood, then at which amount, where's the threshold to give the, uh, the blood back into the system? You know, you take the, do like a, a certain amount of blood you take out of the systems, for example, one liter. But when do you have to reinfuse it on how, which amount you can wash without harming the hemostasis? That's the central question and that uh, I have no answer for that. But perhaps you have to make some tests interoperatively before we give back. That's one, but, but the one point is really important. The suction blood must always be in the view of the perfusionist, because I always have an idea how much blood is outside of the patient. That is really important, not just to use a cell saver. I really recommend to use a separate reservoir and then you can give it back, but you must have the, the, the suction blood in the view, because then you can decide to give it back or not. So what we do in Bern and what we start to do in Bern is so we, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, we had a bit of problem. We stopped the MECC program. We go direction optimize ECC, and perhaps I hope one day we will jump again into a mini bypass or MECC. What we do for the moment that we will try to work with this new reservoir from uh, Spectrum that offers, I think, interesting uh, things because they have this closed uh, chamber, which is a membrane into a it looks like a ball that offers you to, to, to be quite closed for, for cabbage. And we can also not open it, but we can then have the, uh, the opportunity to, to, work, uh, to work as a double chamber reservoir. That means you have the chance to, uh, to make a different, differentiation between good and bad blood. I call it always good, bad blood. The blue are the, the main sucker, that's bad blood. And vent blood is, is quite good blood, you know. Then you can separate that. That is one uh, option that what they offer here with this new reservoir. I'm sure they will penetrate the market in the next months. And uh, let's check that. It's a really interesting thing. And another big advantage that is, even if you have a, a, a membrane in, 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 in a ball, you have the chance to, to use VAVD. So that's the difference between the, the old systems from uh, which were used often in the Netherlands 
they had to put a secondary rotary pump to suck. So that's not the case here. You can really traditionally use uh, uh, vacuum. The other point is, <laughs> one of my favorites is real-time monitoring nowadays. And become, that is really, that becomes important. And why real-time monitoring? Because real-time monitoring, that's a, a online quality check, you know. You see immediately what you're doing. That, that's one point. And on the other hand, it makes uh, perfusion visible, you know. As I started perfusion in the past, we are all hidden behind the machine. Nobody knew what, what we are doing. And we are, if someone came to us and asked, we say, okay, do your job, I do my job. And that completely changed now with, with, with online monitoring. We are, we are visible for everybody. We also discuss with the anesthesiologist and also with the surgeon if something happened. We are not hidden behind the machine. That's one point. And the other is we are a training hospital. You know, if I have young perfusionists behind the machine, I just jump in the, in the, in the theater and you see quickly what happened. So, and everybody see that. That is important thing. And uh, the other point is as well, to be honest, I don't know, in Switzerland, we have really a lack of skilled person. It's quite hard to find uh, experienced perfusionists nowadays. So we have to think about that and to make uh, the, the circuits more safe because the, 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 the niveau from, from the perfusionist will not be the same, I'm absolutely sure, in the future because we have a lack of person we can recruit for, for this profession. And the, on the other hand, this real-time monitoring allows us the implementation of new uh, parameters into the clinical routine. And as well, if you have uh, online monitoring, you have to be aware because as I started, we have some manual notices, all the protocols, and then now that changed completely. Now everything is automated, put alerts in because that really increased the, the safety as well into the, into the overall, as, as pilots are doing, you know. Every parameter has to put a, an alert in. That, is, that helps really. Also, as we started with uh, automatic data registration, I really uh, I felt a bit uh, lost a bit because I couldn't have the opportunity to notice, to make notices about the blood pressure, for example. And then sometimes if the blood pressure decreases, I didn't uh, realize it. So that's why I speak on my side, you know, I know that. So that's really important to put alerts in. And then um, also that will be published from my angle. Yes, Just to give you a, an idea about monitoring. Monitoring has not also been to safe, very, uh, to be very, very complicated. There are easy, easy parameters to measure. They're really implemented now. The venous flow. Nobody measured the venous flow in the past. We have just had this. Uh, the, 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 we measured just our arterial flow. But if you, that can really be a safety tool to measure a venous flow. There's two aspects. For example, during cerebral perfusion, you know exactly what comes back from the brain. So you can really avoid stasis in the brain. And the other point is, you remember all the discussion in the OR. You have, the backflow is, I know, and you have bad backflow. You tell the surgeon, the surgeon, I did nothing, you know. Nobody did nothing, you know. <laughs> but you have, in fact, you have a, a, a bad black backflow. So if you can measure it and you can show, you can say, okay, take a look here. My backflow is reduced. That's a fact. And it's also in, in, in the protocol after. Then you can also start to discuss differently. It's not a question about uh, I did nothing, uh, uh, just it's your problem and so on. The fact is the backflow is reduced. And on the other hand, you can also detect bubbles that come from the venous side. We just, uh, Ignacio discussed that yesterday. So you can also avoid, you can tell the surgeon if you have bubbles that come from the venous side to, to do something. And you can also take, it's not just a, a story for me, it's reality. We measure bubbles that come back from the venous side. Uh, again, to, uh, how to perfuse, so that will take too much time. I'll just give you two, two or three messages. Of course, the, 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 base, uh, the BSA base, uh, for a basis, as a basis for perfusion, that gives you a rough point of reference. Of course, everybody starts with the 2.4, but then you have to adapt the perfusion, as we do nowadays. And we have now so good parameters. Yeah? We, we can guide our perfusion. Okay, SVO2 is the old one, but we have several SO2, we have the DO2, we have extraction rate like that, and perhaps for diffusion, a VCO2, that is also interesting parameter will come if we are able to measure it accurately. That is a bit of a problem for the moment, but we have so much things that come in that make our profession really really, really challenging and interesting again, you know. And um, the challenge, is, as I mentioned, is that um, the correct interpretation of the parameters that can also be challenging. You know, we have so much parameters and our 
topic for the future will then be to bring them in a the, uh, link then together and then not forget we have to see the whole picture not to be focused on one parameter as so often uh, perfusionists that are just fixed on this 280 milliliters of uh, of uh, do2 that's just the same story as we did in the past with a strict flow um and on the other hand I, I hurry. So on the other hand, um, I also wish for me to have in the future a bit more time response based recommendation. I will show you what that means. So I will switch here. You have two approaches for TO2, for example. But an interesting publication from Japan was what they measured was the time under a certain curve, not just to be lower. Because how often we see that the pressure is lower than 50, for example, for a patient. But that will not harm the patient. The question will be how long was it under the on the disc curve. And that I'm absolutely sure that will be future. And I hope that artificial intelligence will help us to analyze data that you can give this recommendation one day. Shortly, uh, I know about what we measure in our clinic, automated. So we have all the parameters here during a case that's transparent for everybody. And we can see, I can also see that from home on my phone, if I will. So that's clear. And we now we have to start to analyze this data to bring them in a context. And hopefully we'll also get then some recommendation about time under a curve. Now I can conclude that, um, to be honest, optimized perfusion are a result of me, ECC. And I really hope then we go, go as well further. And then if you start with optimum ECC, one day you will find a uh, uh, minimized bypass in your clinic, but starting with optimum ECC is never bad. Modern perfusion strategy include more than a perfect perfusion system. Of course, that's real-time monitoring, patient-guided perfusion, data record systems that are equally important, equally important as the system himself. Correct data analysis and data collection enable a better interpretation of key parameters. Time dose response-based recommendations may play an important role in guiding perfusions in the future. So I'm on the end and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for an interesting talk. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Or the panel? Thank you very much for this excellent presentation, hans -Jörg. Um, you talked about a bad and good section, you know. Have you ever uh, considered to use the cell saver to send some of the uh, field blood there instead of using the oxygenator? Uh, cell saver blood, we still use auto transfusion for every case, of course. And uh, for cabbage, for example, it's no reason to re there's so lo uh, low volume of suction blood, we just use cell saving for, for, uh, for cabbage. We never get suction blood back into the, in, into the, into the system for cabbage. But the, the, this, the, the story with you during open heart su uh, surgery is completely different. Then you have to deal with much more blood. And vent blood, as I say, is kind of good blood because it was, a lo a lo was not a long time uh, in contact with air is less uh, activated as 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 um, as the the the, the pericardial shed blood. You know that makes sense then to separate them. And you have reservoirs and you suck. You have two uh, different ports and you can suck the, the the vent blood in one chamber and the blue also uh, the blue sucker in in another one. And then you can decide which one you give back. So normally the vent blood you can give back earlier if it's a lot of blood. And otherwise, you also can wash it if you want. But uh, that's why I make a difference between suction blood. The high activated blood is the shed blood. That's well documented. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Yeah. So we introduce uh, the other presentation. Uh, 